My daughter, Misora, is eight years old. And she knows I work on climate change. So not long ago, she asked me, Daddy, why do we have climate change? Well, I said, it's, it's because some of the tools we use to make our lives nice hurt the earth. And she frowned and she thought about it for a moment. And then she said to me, Daddy, why don't we use better tools? The wisdom of child. Better tools. What are tools? They're just knowledge. They can be physically embodied like a hammer or a shovel, or they can be intangible like facts or rules. But whether they're hardware or software, tools are simply practical knowledge. They're knowledge about how to achieve specific goals. And many of our goals involve solving problems. We see the world as one way, we wish it were another, and so we transform it with our practical knowledge. Outside this building, it's cold and wet much of the year, and yet here we are, warm and dry. The world is dark half the time, but we illuminate the darkness with the flip of a switch. We travel great distances with ease. Food is so plentiful now that we eat too much, as often as not enough. We live lives our ancestors 10,000 years ago couldn't begin to imagine. And their most pressing problems are trivial to us. And the only difference between us and them is that we have better tools. Now, I was fortunate to be raised in an environmentally conscious family. In the 1970s, when I was my daughter's age, I was not aware of climate change, but we were concerned about other environmental problems. The ozone hole, acid rain, lead poisoning. If you're young enough, you might not have even heard of those. If you're old enough, you might have forgotten about them. Now, we've gotten a handle on those problems, and it's not because humanity stopped using things like refrigerators. It's because we use better ones. Now, the world is not perfect. We still have many problems to solve. That's why I became an environmental scientist. But when I began my training in graduate school, I thought we were all there to learn about those problems so that we could discover how to solve them. But I was wrong. Instead, of being surrounded by like-minded optimists who believed we could solve our problems with ingenuity, I found myself surrounded by pessimists. And pessimism is contagious. The idea that we are doomed by climate change, that all other human progress has been for nothing, this is a pathogenic idea that has infected an entire generation worldwide, and it's dead wrong. There is greater cause for optimism today than ever before. My daughter could have said to me, we should stop using tools, but she's wiser than that. She saw that what we need are better tools. So let me show you why she was right. Today, almost 90% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from just three things. Energy, transportation, and food. Energy accounts for over half of all emissions. Transportation, about a fifth. Food, for about a fifth. So what's the solution? What should we do? Should we consume less of these three things? No. Thinking we can solve climate change by consuming less 
is like thinking we can save a burning building by putting out some of the fire. That's just not going to work. Now, of course, we need to be less wasteful. That goes without saying. But the solution is not less energy transportation and food. It's clean energy transportation and food. And the news here is nothing short of spectacular. Because all three of these foundational sectors of the global economy are poised for disruption. So what is disruption? It's when new technologies emerge that dramatically outperform and outcompete older ones, transforming industries or sectors as a result. Now, history shows us that disruptions are not linear. They always follow an S curve. They start out slowly, but then they explode exponentially before eventually slowing again as they reach saturation. And the new technology, as it grows, wipes out the older ones that can no longer compete. We used horses for transportation for thousands of years. And then a century ago, they were disrupted by cars in 15 years. Kodak was the titan of photography in 1995, the year the first digital camera came out. Today, when was the last time you bought a roll of film? Now, because they're not linear, disruptions are unintuitive. They tend to sneak up on us, and then suddenly, they unfold much, much faster than we expect in just a decade or two. For technologies of all kinds, we see the same pattern of disruption again and again throughout history. And disruptions do more than just swap a new technology in for an old one. Electricity wasn't just cheaper whale oil. Automobiles weren't just faster horses. Farming wasn't just more fruitful hunting and gathering. These better tools transformed energy, transportation, and food, and civilization along with them. And now, it's about to happen again. In energy, the technologies are solar power, wind power, and batteries. They used to be expensive, now they're cheap, and they're getting cheaper by the minute. A decade from now, they will be overwhelmingly competitive almost everywhere. That's why they're growing exponentially worldwide. And fossil fuels? They are about to have their Kodak moment. Now, solar, wind, and batteries are not just cheaper coal. The new energy system will be built to handle the worst week of winter. It has to be. But what that means is that for the rest of the year, that system will produce extra energy at virtually no additional cost. So what would you call super abundant energy that's cheap and virtually free? Call it superpower, and it's going to change everything. In transportation, the technologies are electric vehicles, autonomous driving or self-driving, and ride-sharing. They're cheap and getting cheaper, and they're growing exponentially, too. Electric, autonomous cars and trucks that don't need expensive fuel or a driver they are going to move people and goods at a fraction of the cost of road transport today. And the system change that's coming is transportation as a service. When my daughter is 18, she won't need to own a car or even have a driver's license. She won't even need to be able-bodied to travel cheaply and safely, door-to-door, any time of day or night. Now, it's obvious, 
transportation as a service is going to change everything. Combustion engine vehicles? Kodak moment. Well, what about food? Here, the technologies are precision fermentation, which makes proteins and other molecules from microbes, and cellular agriculture, which makes meat, leather, and other animal products from animal cells without harming the animals. The first commercial products have just become available. But a decade from now, my daughter won't be eating animal products. She will be eating food that is better in every way, tastier, healthier, and much, much cheaper. And it's because the new technologies compared to animal products are 10 times more water efficient, 20 times more time efficient, and up to 100 times more land efficient. And the system change that's coming in food is shocking. The end of animal farming because animal products can't compete, that is going to free up an area of land the size of the United States, China, and Australia combined. So just imagine what we could do with all of that land. Conservation, reforestation, rewilding. The changes in the oceans will be stunning as well. They can recover once we're no longer strip mining them with four million commercial fishing vessels. And traditional animal products from livestock and seafood, all of them. Kodak moment. So we already have the tools we need. They are science fact today, not science fiction and they won't be expensive. Disruption happens because the new technologies are so much cheaper. That's what makes them unstoppable. We pass that critical tipping point, the system flips, and suddenly we have the immense power of markets working for us instead of against us. And it would be extraordinary enough if even one of these foundational sectors were poised for disruption, but we are going to see all three of them disrupted simultaneously over the next three years, uh, th over the next 30 years. I wish it were three years. So what do they give us? 90% reduction in net greenhouse gas emissions by 2035. That is far more progress, far faster than most of us would dare imagine. That is cause for real optimism. That's just the beginning. It gets better. What about all the carbon we've already emitted? What about the harm we've already done? To save a burning building, it's not enough to put out the fire. You have to repair the damage as well. In many ways, that's the harder part. But these same tools will allow us to withdraw carbon and heal the atmosphere and oceans affordably. So they open the door to a truly complete solution to climate change beyond just mitigation. That is cause for real optimism. And it doesn't stop there because the same tools that help us solve climate change will help us tackle every other environmental problem as well. Deforestation, ocean acidification, air and water pollution, habitat and biodiversity loss, waste processing and recycling, all of them become solvable with better tools. That is cause for real optimism. And there's still more because it's not just environmental challenges. Every social goal becomes more achievable as well. Clean, cheap, abundant, Energy, transportation, and food, they are going to be massively liberating and democratizing. They will lift billions into prosperity. That is cause for real optimism. Now, we can't be complacent. Every year that we delay increases the risk of climate catastrophe. 
So technology alone is not enough. We must make good choices. We, as individuals, as industries, as entire nations, must choose to accelerate these disruptions with our voices, with our votes, with our wallets. The sooner we do, the sooner we can meet this formidable challenge. But we can meet it. You don't need anyone's permission to be optimistic, and optimism can be just as contagious as pessimism. So get out there and be an optimism super spreader. My daughter was right. The solution is better tools, and we already have them. We can thrive, and and we can heal our planet at the same time. That is a future worth building for Misora, for all of our children. So let's start building it today, and let's build it together. Thank you.